Hello folks, I am Kalyan Prasad and today I'm going to talk about decision tree visualization and it's really incredible and such an honor being given to speak to you all today at PyCon EPAC. I'm really super excited to talk to you all and thank you all uh, for taking time and uh, joining my talk. Some cheap marketing. Uh, I'm a self-taught data scientist and analytics manager currently working with one of the startup based in Hyderabad and I'm a community first person. I love being involved with different communities and I try to help communities as much as I can. Currently, I'm associated with the following organizations called uh, PyCon India, PyCon Hyderabad, Hyderabad Python User Group and Humans for AI, where I perform different roles and responsibilities in all these organizations. I love to give back to community, so I always look for an opportunities to share my knowledge in multiple platforms. Yeah, no, that's uh, pretty much about me. So here is the agenda for today's talk. So we'll start uh, with understanding decision trees and we'll see the type of decision trees we have. And then we'll see some of the key in elements involved in the decision trees. And uh, finally, we'll see the why GTV's library is really useful uh, for visualizing decision trees. And we'll see some action on say, uh, on visualizing the decision trees. And uh, finally, we'll wrap up our talk accordingly. So without any further delays, let's get started. What is decision trees? In machine learning era, we have so many fancy algorithms that give more accurate predictions. But when it comes to decision trees, they are pretty easy to understand because it is pretty straightforward and one of the easiest algorithm in machine learning. A decision tree uses tree-like script presentation or a structure or a design and decision model to get actual inferences. A decision tree is one of the most simple and intuitive techniques in machine learning based on the divide and conquer paradigm. Meaning that decision trees are constructed via algorithmic approach that identifies a base to split the data based on different conditions. Now, the idea behind decision tree is to partition the spaces into patches and to fit a model to a patch. In a simple terms, the objective of the decision tree is to create a training model that can be used to predict the value of a target variable by learning simple decision rules inferred from data features, which is nothing but the training data. Of course, decision trees are building blocks of so many advanced algorithms. For example, Random Forest, XGBoost, the two most popular machine learning algorithms for structured data. And finally, decision trees are part of supervised learning algorithms. Unlike other supervised learning algorithms, decision trees can be used to solve both classification and regression problems as well. Now, the types of decision trees are based on the type of a target variable we have. So it can be a regression decision tree and it can be a classification decision tree. So how do we identify which type of a target variable we are dealing with or when we are working on a data? So how do, how do we identify such things? So this is a pretty simple easy. Uh, so a decision tree which has a continuous target variable, then it is called as a continuous or regression decision tree. For example, predicting the house price, so which is a continuous target variable in that case, we use a regression decision tree. Now that decision tree which has a categorical target variable, then it is called as a category or classification decision tree. For example, predicting the risky loan applications in the entire loan. So this will help us to give a less loan rate. So this will help us to identify less loan rates. So that's how we identify the target variables when we are dealing with uh, when we are dealing with the different types of decision trees. Now, key elements. So, in order to familiarize familiarize uh, with the decision trees, we need to understand some of the key elements involved in decision trees. So, I, we can also call it them as a flow of chart or a structure of a decision tree. So, it has been primarily classified into three parts. First one is a root node, and the second one is a terminal node or a leaf node, and the third one is branches. So we'll understand all these key elements by looking at this visual. So we'll start with the root node. The very top of the tree is called a root node, and then we have a 
splitting. So it is a process of dividing the nodes into two or more sub nodes. Then we have a decision node. So a sub node, uh, when a sub node divided into further sub nodes, it's called a decision node. So if you observe here, the decision node is divided into another sub node. So that is called a decision node. And the node which does not divide anything is called a terminal node or a leaf node, which means that so this will be the last node. So there will be no any splits in the tree here. And then a subsection of the entire decision tree is called a branches so here it is the branches here and uh, finally we have a parent and child node so when a node is divided into sub nodes then it is called as a parent node of a sub node whereas sub nodes are a child of parent node meaning that so if you look at our example a is our parent node and b and c are our child nodes so this is how exactly the structure works structure flows is a flow structure of a decision tree. Now let's look at some real time example to understand the decision tree process much better in real time. So here is a problem we have where you know, a person who has a job offer and he's thinking that whether he wants to act with the job offer or not. So to solve this problem, so we'll start looking at from the root node. So here the root node is a salary. So here the salary is between the $5,000 to $8,000. And this root node has been now split into one decision node and one leaf node based on the corresponding labels. So if you look at here, the decision node here is office near to home, which is meaning by the distance. So whether the offices are near to his home or not. Now, it, this decision node has again further split into another decision node and leaf node. So here, the next decision node is again providing a cap facility or not. I mean, like pretty crazy requirements here. Uh, so, so if you look at that, and finally, the decision node has fitted into a two leaf node, which is accepting offer or declining offer. So it all started with the salary. So if a salary is between $5,000 to $8,000, and yes, then uh, if the office is near to my home or not, if it is near, then it is yes. Again, if they are providing a grant facility, even though I am near to my office, if though they should they are, they are providing the camp facility, then definitely I'll accept the offer. I mean, that person is accepting the offer, otherwise he's simply declining the offer. Pretty crazy, right? Now, okay, take a part. So this is exactly how the decision process works in a real time for any data science problem. So by this, I hope you got a pretty fair understanding about the decision trees and how the decision tree process works in a real time. Now let's jump into the next section, which is d -trees. So before I talked about uh, d trees library, let me tell you some of the issues which are existing in the current visualization packages. So what is the need of a d trees here? So I'll talk about those points first, then I'll, then I'll come to this is D3VS, importance of a D3VS. Now, it is always said that a picture is a worth of a thousand words. This principle is equally applicable for machine learning models as well, because if one can visualize and inspect, it inculcates more confidence in the model predictions. That's true, right? Now, visualizing a decision tree is a tremendous aid when learning how this model works and interpreting these models. Unfortunately, our current visualization packages are not immediately helpful to the novice. Uh, for example, we do not have any library that visualizes how our decision nodes is created at feature spaces. When it comes to scikit-learn library, plotting libraries, it inherently has a plotting capabilities for visualizing decision trees via you know, a scale on dot tree dot export graphics function. But however, it has some issues. We'll see that uh, when we move on to hands-on part. Now, I mean, you can see that we have a couple of problems here. So do we have any alternative to solve all these problems? Yes, we have. So this is where the D3 Viz library comes into the picture to solve all these problems. Now, what is D3 Viz library? So first things first. So it is a Python library for decision revisualization and model interpretation. 
This library currently supports scikit-learn, XGBoost, Spark, Emblem, and LightGBM trees. The best part of the previous library is not only creating a beautiful visuals, but also conveying more information about the decision process, which you which you will see lively when we move on to the hands-on part. And trust me, uh, you will agree with this point. With the previous library, we can also visualize how the feature space is created at decision nodes and how the training samples get distributed in leaf nodes and then how the tree used for prediction for a specific observation. So we'll be covering all these uh, features in our hands-on part. So I think I have given uh, enough download or enough GAN on theory. So let's jump into hands-on part to see the, some action on decision tree visualizations. Okay, so let me quickly move to my code notebook. So here is the notebook which I have created for this demonstration. So the goal is to show you the power of the previous library and I'll also show you the different ways to visualize the decision trees in this uh, dem entire demonstration. So, uh, so in order to proceed further, so I've installed a couple of libraries here, uh, which is a uh, pi dot plus and uh, in graphs and the previous library. So pi dot plus library is uh, uh, which shows the Python interface on uh, graphs dot image and the graphs library. So this library with this library we can visualize the decision trees. We'll see that in a while. And of course uh, with the previous library also we can we can visualize the decision tree and get our results much better comparatively with graphs. I'll show you that as well in in a moment. So cool, I have installed all these libraries. So now I have important necessary suspects here. So of course, uh, when, even when we start with any data process, so I will get really important necessary libraries here. So this is exactly what I have done here. And from scikit-learn, I'm importing data sets. So for this demonstration, I'm taking two popular data sets from scikit-learn, one for the classification case and another for other one for progression. So, <clears throat> so, for classification case, I am uh, taking uh, Wine dataset uh, from SKL and datasets, and uh, we'll see, we'll start seeing with a traditional way of visualizing the decision tree. So I'll see, we'll show, we'll show you the different uh, ways of uh, traditional ways of visualizing the decision tree with a classification case. Then we'll see it in a DTV style as well. Okay, so I have loaded my data set here and then I've initiated my X and Y variables here. Now I'm fitting my classifier. So uh, I'm initiated my classifier, decision tree classifier, and I didn't pass any hyper parameter here. Uh, instead, so, so I'm just uh, going with the default parameters here uh, rather than passing any uh, specific hyper parameters. Now I'm fitting my classifier on this point data set. So from this fine data set, uh, so, uh, so we are predicting the class of wine. So since it is a classification case, so the target is always a category here. So our prediction here is about the different classes of wines. Now, uh, so we can, be, as I mentioned that we can visualize the decision trees in multiple ways. So we'll see uh, all those in a step-by-step -step now. So first is a text representation. So this helps us to build a text report showing the rules of a decision tree. So this is a pretty straightforward. So what I have done is I've created a text representation variable, and then I'm calling tree.export underscore text function and passing my instance classification here. So you can pass anything, either a classification instance or a regression instance. So it's up to you which one you want to pass. In my case, I have passed a classification instance. So now once I execute this, Oops, sorry, I need to load my data. Oops, again, sorry, because I didn't import my libraries. Okay, all right, they should work now. Cool. So there, there we got a, a decision tree uh, in a text representation. And if you also see that we got a features here, and we can also see the decimal rounded up to two figures. And we can also see the classification weights, which are the number of samples in each class. That's pretty cool here. And this, this feature is especially helpful when we, when we are working on applications without user interface or when we want to log 
information about the model into a text file. Now, another way of visualizing a decision tree is with a plot underscore tree function from scikit-learn. So with this function, we can visualize the decision tree and interpret our results. So let's see that as well. <clears throat> so here I have given my fixed size in a 20 by 15. So I want my image to be showcased in this particular uh, size. And then I'm calling my plot underscore tree function and passing my classification tree here. And then I'm passing a couple of parameters here is a future name, which is nothing but name of the each of the futures in my data set and a class name, name of the each of the target class in ascending order from my data set. Field equals to true, which means that uh, field equals to true. So what this, it does is this method highlights the majority of the classes with the color. So when we have given field equals true, which means that it highlights the uh, uh, majority classes in a color. If I remove this parameter, now everything will showcase in a plain vanilla color. So I, I'll show you, uh, instead of talking, let me show you visually this rounded equals to true, which means that I want my values to be in a rounded. So let me execute this. So there we got a, colors. So, so these are the majority of the classes from this visual. Now we got a very big tree decision tree visualization here. And the reason behind for this much of a big tree is that we didn't uh, pass any you know, depth parameter in our classifier that, uh, that we want to restrict our uh, max depth size so and so. So that is the reason why we got an entire decision tree here on our uh, wine data set. Uh, this looks a uh, very good uh, decision tree structure. However, it is not that easily readable, right? So you cannot be read even even if I even if I zoom also even if I zoom also, it is quite uh, difficult to you know read these things. So what we can do is, so we can improve this uh, visualization uh, with the help of a uh, graphics library. So before proceeding in that, let, so let me remove this uh, parameter. Uh, let me hide this parameter for some time and show you how the visual looks if I remove this. So this is how it looks in a plain vanilla. It, it, so this is even uh, much complicated to understand the uh, decision tree uh, structure and uh, the different target classes. So let me again uh, go back to my original uh, parameter. <clears throat> let me rerun this. Okay, cool. Now <clears throat> we'll see uh, uh, the visualization uh, with the help of graphics uh, library. So this is also uh, uh, pretty same. So where first I initiated my tree dot as a string uh, dot IO. So now this is used for input output text stream. And then I'm calling my tree dot export graphics function and passing my parameters here, classification, and I want my output file to be tree dot and pass the same parameters which you have seen above. Then I'm calling my pi dot dot graph as dot dot tree, uh, which means that you know, uh, now my image will convert into a graphics dot image and then I'm converting that image into a PNG file. So let me execute this. So you can see, uh, you can see the similar result with same set of elements what we have seen above. So this looks a pretty same set of elements. Everything remains the same, but, but this graph looks much better comparatively with this. Now let's dig into this visualization to understand uh, what are the issues with this uh, graphics. So by looking at this visual, it is immediately not clear that what are these ac colors actually represent. So what are these different colors actually represent? And, and also uh, there are uh, no labels for our target class, no legends for our target class. Uh, it also, we can also see that it has included the Gini coefficient uh, certain score space, but it really doesn't help with the interpretation. Then we can also see the count of samples in our visual, but we cannot visualize the distribution in this case. So this is where you know, our histogram really helps us in this case. And if you also observe this graph, the size of each decision node 
looks same regardless the number of samples. So same size. I mean, like it is quite difficult to uh, identify uh, the count of samples because everything looks is with the same size here. And uh, and also the uh, and what else we have here? Yeah, I mean, so these are a couple of problems which are existing with the default scikit-learn uh, uh, decision tree behavior. So, so in order to eradicate all these problems, so this is where our D3 with library comes into the picture to solve all these problem and it shows a more comprehensive and clear picture on the decision tree visualization. So let's see that now. So, so far, whatever we have seen is the traditional way of visualizing decision trees. Now we'll see in a D3 with style. So uh, when it comes to D-Trivis style, so, so it's again, so I'm uh, calling my D-Trivis function and passing the uh, parameters for class X and Y variables. And I'm tar giving my target name, giving my feature names, class names, and also some other parameters called fancy his type. So I want my histogram figures to be in a stacked bar and scale parameters. So just remember these two parameters called fancy and scale. So I'll talk about these parameters in some time, uh, so, but for the moment, you just uh, follow me with the flow. So once I execute this, okay, let me rerun this again. So, okay, yeah, so, yeah. So there we got a beautiful uh, decision tree visualization on our find data set classification. So this looks uh, much better now. And now let's dig into this visualization to understand the decision tree process much better. Now, by looking at this visual, at each node, we can see that Stacked histogram of the future that is used for splitting the observation colored by class. So now you see that every histogram we have a picture that is has been splitted for the observations. And if you also look at this black triangle with the value at the x-axis, so this is the splitting point here. So if you look at the black triangle at all these uh, figures, so which shows the exact splitting point here. And we can also see the class one. We can also see some of the samples in the class one that are clustered at the end of this proline feature space. So basically, uh, <clears throat> so so all this. Uh, so in in this uh, in the retrieval library, when it comes to classification, so histograms were used to illuminate the feature space. So this is exactly what here. And when if you look more to the leaf nodes, we can see that they are represented as a pie chart, which shows that what fraction of observation, what fraction of observation within each leaf, within each leaf belongs to which class? I mean, like, so, so this fraction belongs to which class? We can see that, you know, what fraction of this particular observation belongs to which class? So we, now we can call, also call this as, you know, majority class and model prediction. So. This is our um, majority class, and this is our model prediction here. See how pretty cool it is. I mean, like so. So if you if you observe, like no, it has the same set of a uh, code and same set of function comparatively with uh, what we have seen above. But how the result differs comparatively with the uh, with this visualization and this visualization. Now, if we visually compare this default psychic uh, uh, visual and this uh, D3 visual. So we can, we can clearly say that this visualization shows and conveys more clear and uh, conveys more clear decision tree process information to the stakeholders rather than this one, because it has some potentially some issues, but this looks much better. The only thing, missing in this entire decision tree visual is what the Gini coefficient for each decision node. But I guess it is really not required here because uh, our histogram clearly provides more intuition about the decision split and it really not, it, I think so it is really not required about the Gini correlation uh, uh, number here. So I believe that this is a perfect visual to convey 
the information about the decision tree process to any people. So by this, we have finished the uh, demonstration. We have finished our demonstration on our classification case. Now let's move to the, our regression one. Now you can also save your image if you want to use it on your uh, future purpose. So you can do that you know, by using this dot save that decision underscore tree dot SVG. So now this will save my image. So you can also see that here. So it has saved my image so that I can use it whenever it is required for me. Now visualizing a regress is the same as visualizing a classifier, except the only change needs here is a target name. So for regression, for regression case, I am taking the Boston data set from the scikit learn library. Now, again, so I have loaded my data here and I have initiated my X and Y variables. And now I'm fitting my regressor and instead of a default parameters, I am giving my max depth is equal to tree. So I'm restricting my tree size here. And now I'm fitting my regressor on this Boston housing price data. So let me load this. So we can also do the same traditional process what we have done in the classification for regression as well, but I have skipped that because I don't want to show or repeat the same process, explain the same process again and again, but you can definitely give it a try and see how it works. <clears throat> and uh, so from this uh, thing, so from this data set, our goal is you now we are taking a certain we are taking a certain areas to predict the median housing prices in certain areas of Boston. So we are predicting the median housing prices from certain areas of Boston from this data set. Now, straight away, I'm jumping into the d style. So this code is a pretty straightforward here. So there is no much change. So instead of a class, classification we have passed the regression and we have changed uh, we have changed our target name and giving my feature names here and giving the title and then again uh, i want my title color to be purple that's it and there we got a beautiful visualization on our boston data set regression now let's start uh, dig into this uh, visualization to understand the decision tree process on the regression case when it comes to classification, we have seen the stacked histograms of the feature that were used for spreading the observations. Now, when it comes to regression, we can see the scatter plots of the feature that were used for spreading the observations. And if you also observe, we can see the dashed lines on the scatter plots. What are those? The horizontal dashed line indicates the target mean from the left to right bucket in the decision nodes. And the vertical line, dashed line, indicates the splitting point here. And if you also look at this uh, black, wedge, black wedge triangle, which, which is again a splitting point, and it also shows the exact splitting point value here. And if you look at, if you look at this black triangle, we can see the exact splitting value here. And if you move to leaf nodes, we can see the dashed lines on, we can also see the dashed lines here. So which means the mean of the target within leaf and which is also called model prediction here. So see how cool it is and how we have gained insightful info, information from this visualization. And, and also <clears throat> if you look at this visualization, so we, we, we pretty cool to understand and uh, and uh, very easy to gain insights from this visual and this 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 visuals will really help us to build a better model because it it shows a path it shows a, it, it clearly shows a path to build a better models better decision models and that will definitely improve our now business standpoint so i hope you got all this visual so so with this, uh, we have finished our uh, regression case as well. Now, finally, we have customization. So the best part of the previous library is it offer a lot of customization. So I have covered a bunch of them on this two data sets. So we'll see uh, one by one now. Scaling the image. 
So as I mentioned earlier that, you know, I will be talking about the scaling parameter. Now, this is, this is the time to tell you. The scaling parameter can be used to scale the overall image. So, so it is again a pretty straightforward. So the, the, the entire code is already you are familiar with. So there is no change here. The only thing is we need to pass a scale parameter here. I pass as a 0.5 value. So once I execute this, my image look uh, much crisp, clear, and short. So so this is how we can scale our image. So it's up to you how you want to scale your image. So you can increase the size and you can uh, decrease size. So it's up to you how you want to do it. Next, we have a colors. So colors really play a very key role in data visualization because we'll get a lot of insights from colors. Now, when in this is in d library, we have a optional parameter where we can pass a colors as a dictionary and which has to be which is to be used in the plot. So this is exactly what I'm doing here. So I have passed a colors of dictionary here, and uh, now I want my scattered dots to be in a green color. So once I execute this, boom, there you see that, you know, I see the green dots on, on my scattered plot. So how cool it is, you know, so this is where you can, you know, clearly highlight uh, this particular point and uh, you can explain uh, the, uh, I can explain behind the issue or you can expand behind the split to your uh, stakeholders. So this is where the color helps in. So if you want to know more about colors, how you can use the different colors at different ways. So just go through the documentation page of the TTVs library and try to know more things from there. And next we have is show node label. So we can turn on node labels on the nodes. Uh, so uh, this can be done by passing a parameter called show node labels equals to true. So once I execute this, my code, there you see a node label. So you can see a node zero, node one, node 12, node nine, node 10, node 14. So this feature is especially useful when you are explaining the decision tree process to your stakeholders. So in this case, what you can do is you can simply mention or you can simply highlight uh, uh, about the point or the split which you are talking about by mentioning the node number. So see how cool it is uh, 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 to explain a particular thing with the help of a road number, node number. Next we have is a simple graph without histogram or scatter plots. So as the name mentioned that, uh, so as the name mentioned that, so we don't want to see any histogram or scatter plots on my visual. So, so this will generate a very simple, uh, clean, simple, simple tree plot. So, so how can we do it? So, so the, so the, the, the code, everything is already, if you are familiar here, the only change the only parameter which we need to mention here is equal to fancy equals to false. So the parameter which I was talking about earlier is a fancy. So when you give fancy is equal to fancy equals true, so which which definitely highlights either a histogram or you no know, scatter plots again depending upon the tree which we are plotting. But when you give it as a false parameter, it will simply plot a plain tree structure. Now this is especially you know this is especially useful. Uh, for the folks who know want to see this uh, plain tree structure, but uh, definitely I'm I'm not a huge fan of to see the decision tree in that way because I wish I always look I always like to see the histograms and scatter plots because the, that that shows me or no that helps me to understand uh, to gain much in more information rather than this uh, plain stuff. So it's up to you how you want to use it, uh, but I'm not a huge fan of that. I'm not a huge fan of this uh, tree. Now, next we have a tree with a left to right element. So by default, the structure of a tree is top to down, but you can change the alignment from left to right uh, with the help of a, a parameter called orientation. So this is exactly what I've done here. I passed a parameter called orientation is equal to left to right. So once I execute this, there we see the left to right orientation. This is again, especially for you know, useful for the folks who wish to see a, the uh, left to right orientation, who is to see you know, the tree structure orientation in left to right rather than the top to down. 
And next we have is a prediction path of a single observation. So this helps us to understand which decision path is followed by a specific test observation. So, so what I'm doing is uh, uh, from, I'm, I'm generating a random sample from our data set and transfers its decision path. So, so generated random, random here and passing it its transfer decision path. So once I execute this, let's see the visual to understand much better. So now by looking at this visual, the orange color here clearly highlights that which path is followed by our observation. So if you see this orange color indicating that, it shows that you know which path is followed by our observation. And we can also see the orange triangle at each of the histogram, which indicating the which indicating the observation value of a feature. So if you see the orange triangle at each of them, so it's indicating the value of the fixed value of observation of value of feature. And finally, we can also see the value of the features of the observation that is used for highlighting, that is used for highlighting the decision in an orange color. So in our case, if you look at this visual, there are three features that were used to predict the observations belongs to class one. See how cool it is uh, and you no. Know, and so how this is how uh, we can uh, identify a specific test observation on uh, no single uh, by predicting it by knowing a single prediction path and uh, and next we have is a only path so in the above we have seen that how we can use a, a prediction path for single observation now here we see here this only path which means that we we see only the nodes that were used for the prediction so again, I've generated my random sample from the data set and transferring its decision path. And also additionally, I'm passing a parameter called show just path equals to true. So once I, once I execute this, now this will show me the exact nodes that were used for prediction. So these were the nodes, proline flavors and color intensity were the nodes used for predicting the class zero. And these were the future that we are used for predicting this class zero. So how cool it is, right? So, and we can also uh, do our prediction path in a plain English. So this is taken pretty straightforward here. So I'm calling my explain prediction path function and passing my instance and X factor, giving my feature names here. And I want my explanation type to be in a plain English. So once I execute this, there we got, uh, my prediction path in plain English. And this is especially useful when you are explaining uh, for the folks who has you no know, uh, very less knowledge and we can simply mention that you know how our uh, see how our uh, <clears throat> how our model has used this uh, particular prediction path. So this is how you can clearly explain them uh, with this uh, uh, in plain English. And finally, we have a future importance. We can predict the future importance uh, with the help of a decision tree. Uh, but with this reviews library, we can also visualize the top features that were involved in uh, predicting the decision tree. So again, I'm calling my explain prediction path function where I'm passing my regression parameter here and also giving my X factor, future names and explanation type is the default scikit learn. And once I execute this, there I got a future stop feature that was involved in the decision tree prediction. So in, in our case, RM, CRIM, and LST80 were the top futures that were involved in decision tree prediction on our Boston housing prices. So with this, <clears throat> we have finished our uh, practical hands-on part of our session. And uh, you can say that, I can now say that, I have seen that how DTREVIS library is useful for creating a beautiful and insightful visualization. And we have also seen that, uh, uh, you know, how DTREVIS library is much better or more uh, generated more comprehensive picture comparatively with the default uh, scikit learn library. And we have also seen that how these plots are really helpful in conveying the decision tree process information to the stakeholders or even for the folks who have less ML knowledge or no technical knowledge as well. And finally, 
there is so much more you can do and explore uh, with the DTPS library, but I believe this is plenty that you can uh, get started. So with this, uh, we have finished our hands-on part. So let me quickly move back to my slides. So here are the quick references uh, for exploring the DTPS library and decision trees. So feel free to check them out. And uh, thank you. I am open to take questions if I have any. And a big thank you to PyCon Epic organizers for organizing an amazing event. You guys have really done a great job and keep up the good work. And uh, if you have any feedback, suggestions or comments, or if you want to talk to me anything about data science uh, or self-learning or a community, feel free to connect me on this uh, platform. I'll be happy to connect and chat with you all. And yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's it from my end and i'll see you all around take care bye okay hello Kalyan, how are you i'm well how are you <laughs> so um so we will have we are now with um Kalyan and then um, for those of you who would like to ask him any question about uh, data visualization, please feel free to raise your hand and then also like ask him about what you want to know. So mm -hmm. I already watched your, your um, talk already. It's just very good for me. So you're very like very good at uh, demon demonstrate all of like the, it. It's a step by step like tell us uh, from like the beginning to installation something mm -hmm. to import and also share the difference of like um, uh, the tools yeah. that we can represent data. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your work now? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, yeah, uh, as you all know, I'm Kalyan Prasad and I'm basically based out of uh, India Hyderabad and currently working as a data scientist and analytic manager uh, with one of the startup based in Hyderabad where uh, I also lead a small data science team in my organization and we provide data science solutions to marketing and sales domain. Uh, prior to data science, I was completely into business operations, uh, into a fintech industry, business operations and business analysis. I'm a completely a self-taught data scientist. I transition altogether a different career from my previous experience to this. So I have pretty good uh, uh, experience both in fintech and marketing now. Uh, apart from my professional life, I love being involved in different uh, communities and I love to help those communities as possible I can. And I'm currently associated with a couple of organizations called uh, PyCon India, uh, PyCon Hyderabad, Hyderabad Python User Group and New Humans for AI, where I perform my different roles and responsibilities all together in all these different organizations. And I also love to give back to community. So I always look for an opportunity to share my knowledge, whatever I know. Uh, so that's pretty much about me. Mm -hmm. So mostly uh, you are, um, as your work, right, you will represent data to the like, management level to make decision? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So can you share us about experience using like what's called DT with, right, to represent data? Is this enough to just show all that or just you need to do something after that to represent the data? To the management no so d d3 is it's like it's an open source library uh, which is especially for an you know, decision tree visualization and a model intuition so this visualization with with the help of d3 is library so you will get a clear picture of you know uh, how the, i mean like what exactly you want to do uh, what exactly you are predicting without uh, doing a machine learning model so d3 is library will help you to showcase you that the area to showcase your predictions so based on that visual it will easy for you to build a model uh, with a better accuracy and just in case if you also mess and it's easy to, to take different things and parameters into the consideration which will make which will help your which will help you can build your model more effectively uh, and that might help your business and which you can easily convey to your stakeholders the best part of dtv's library is those visions are pretty uh, straightforward and uh, easy even though if you don't have a machine learning skills or even if you are a layman i mean like you don't have any technical knowledge also those widgets are pretty straightforward to understand uh, the importance so which we can easily convey to even uh, for a non-technical folks as well mm -hmm. information yeah so i saw that you show us a lot about how to use like parameter to customize right so mostly can you tell us what 
what kind of a uh, parameter that you really like you use very often like for me i really like like left to life um alignment this is like change the, the way to look in the tree so which one that most effective um uh, parameter of things that you use very often so uh, so before i talk about parameter i'll tell you something that you no know, we should always think in a perspective that whether uh, let's say i build a decision tree model so we should i know whether it is a very good whether the good decision tree which i built or not so how do you know whether it is a good tree or not so in that case so evaluating your uh, model uh, tree model generally boils to how you evaluate any business decision so did it work well or how well it did it work if it did it work so why did it work so how can i improve that so so we so we need to take all this con- things into the consideration before you know we actually go or put the things into the production so to evaluate your model so a lot of analytics teams i mean like as an analytic team manager and also a lot of analytic teams is generally typically refer to the standard metrics which are the also the standard parameters which are nothing but you know commonly used ones are the first one is the accuracy and you know the next one is a r square or you know uh, adjusted r square so accuracy is like if we take what the what the available data do we have and you are building a tree for example let's say you are taking a building a tree with the 80% of your team data and how well did you predict with the other remaining 20% or let's say if you are taking something on 75% how well you have predicted better on that 25% so th- th- those 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 are the things which are uh, things which we t- definitely take into the consideration when you are evaluating your model and on the other note r square error so how much variant you could or could your independent variable explain in accordance with your outcome variable and the higher the r square number the better the model is or the range of r square number should be in you know, somewhat you know if it is a zero or one in between then it is a mathematically or i can say it's mathematically anomaly so these are some of the common parameters we take into consideration while evaluating the model apart from these there are also some of the most common metrics that we use uh, in a real time when we are building a machine learning models which are nothing but a mean squared error a mean absolute error true positives and true false negatives which are especially used on the classification cases on which is nothing but a confusion matrix decision recall or reciprocals gains so these these are often i mean the frequent uh, metrics or parameters which we use in a real time for uh, evaluating our uh, uh, machine learning models mm, okay so oh for those who have question you can raise your hand also like i just keep like asking him, him question <laughs> if you have any questions just feel free to ask also so since you already like have experience in like um, data side right so do you have any tip or t- uh, tricks that you want to share with everyone anything that like mm-hmm. so uh, as i also was talking the same point in yesterday in my panel discussion as well so if you are an aspiring data scientist or no whatever aspiring uh, roles you are seeking whether it is a data science data engineering or big data or a cloud whatever it may be so there are many different roles in each of uh, these domains i mean like uh, so you have to figure out first that what exactly you want to do what kind of a skill set or a capabilities you have so based on that you can upskill things easily so that you can get into your desired job so instead of uh, simply blindly going with the bus stuff or uh, let's say for example if a data science so people always target about the deep learning computer vision natural language processing they simply uh, simply ignore the basics which are uh, sql excel data visualization stuff so these are the core basics if you want to reach out to those sites so always uh, try to make your foundation solid so that you know you can uh, you can then you can uh, pick up your uh, own domain so then they can then you can master your skills on whichever area you want so foundations are really important in any of the field so whether it is a data engineering or data science so foundations are the key for any successful role so you have to always make your foundation strong even when i was transitioning my own career so i was literally blown away with all because internet will definitely confuse you with a lot of stuff because there is a tons of information available on the internet so when you look at that you will definitely get confused so i blamed that blunder mistake when i was transitioning all these careers because i really don't know what to do i have i had a dream to to do transition to career of a data scientist but i was really not sure that where exactly i have to start what exactly i need to learn so i faced a lot of problems on that when i was transitioning but later i realized my capabilities and my abilities 
and what is what exactly I want to do in uh, so what kind of a job I want to work. So based on that, I have figured out my skills and I've learned everything accordingly. So you have to plan your structure of the thing that what exactly you want to learn and what exactly what kind of a role you want to work. Based on that, you can upskill yourself. So it is not uh, possible that everything you can't learn in a single go. So it takes uh, you should have a mindset of a lifetime learner. That that's how you will grow in your career and you can upskill in your life. So there is nobody a master in real time. Even if you take 15, 20 years experience, folks also they are not a masters. They are still a learners. They keep on upgrading or upskilling themselves. That's how they became a leaders today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw like in your profile, you said like you are like self learner, right? You uh, learn everything by yourself. So you yeah. know like which one that, you, and then you explore it and then you find which one that you like and you like just try to firm your foundation and you can expand more on that. Mm-hmm. I think um, since we start uh, a little bit late, so we can like maybe like just uh, keep going a little bit and then we can um, like spend more time, like maybe like seven, uh, maybe four, like 17. Right. So for those who have questions, I saw many people join us. So if you have any question you want to ask uh, Kalyan Prasad, right, you can uh, please feel free to ask him also. So, oh, so Kalyan, um, as you, how long you use DT with, uh, in your work and what makes different from like the previous like grab or uh, like graphic text, the thing that you used before, what is the difference? That you so, feel. The, the problem with, uh, uh, I mean, like Graph is also a very good library uh, in terms of a decision tree visualization, but there are some certain issues which you cannot uh, immediately understand by looking at the Graph Visual Library. As I mentioned in my talk, that you know you cannot understand what uh, it shows with the different colors. So, what are those colors actually re- refer to that particular visual? I mean, we are not sure what kind of a class the teacher was talking about. Uh, so, comparatively with the D3 base, it clearly classified what kind of a classes they are and what, are, what is your target variable and what exactly you are predicting with the, uh, your leaf node. So, everything will be in a very pretty straightforward. That's what I was saying that, you know, it is very easy to understand for even for the folks who really don't have a machine learning knowledge also. So, I can quickly show the visual and I can quickly explain them. Now. So, this is, a, this is a class and this is what I'm predicted. So, I can straight away tell them. Uh, so, even, even a non-technical uh, People can also easily understand by looking at that. So that that's that's a key of a previous comparative with a graphics library. Even the author has also had the, author, the, the library author also has addressed the same thing that that was a pain point which are existing in the default cycle line library comparatively with the previous one. And I will also yeah. say that I mean, so I like, it's uh, very useful, right? Yeah, yeah, it's also very useful. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like I think yeah, we have like just maybe one, one more minute. If you want to say uh, anything to everyone before we leave, yeah, please feel free to do that. So, so one thing I can tell you that, you know, so do whatever you, I mean, like if you're passionate to do things, you can, anything you can do. So there is no, I mean, like a technical background or a technical background required for a lot of people think that, you know, they come from a different background. Can I do this particular stuff? I came from a automobile engineering or something like that. Will I can do, uh, we can like can do or work in a artificial AI roles or a data science roles. So everything is possible. I mean, like you should have a, a right mindset or a right things you want to do. So you should have a passion to do things. So definitely you can do so. Background or academic doesn't stop you to reach out to your goals. So that's what I can say. Because I came from a commerce and uh, finance background. So altogether I now into data science. So which is nowhere related to mine. But but the best part which was really helped me is the domain expertise. So domain knowledge is, is a solid thing uh, in a data science and AI role place. So that is one of the advantages which I have. I mean, so so anyone can do anything. So this is what I can tell. So so there is no restriction for particular things if you want to do it in your career. Yeah, if you have passion, right? And you said you go, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And of course, so, last not, last point, last point, I would also like my try to being involved with different communities and try to be part of the community so that you know community will teach you a lot of things and you will learn a lot of things from uh, community by meeting new people uh, and you know by listening to their talks or you know by talking to them. So you'll get to know more and more things. Is what I can say. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Like community help us to share knowledge and then help each other. So like yeah. you, uh, one last question for me, your demo is very useful. Are you like um, um, open for everyone to take a look on that or is any way to contact you if someone want to ask you some question? Yeah, uh, maybe I can uh, type in my chat. So feel free to reach out to me on my, it's already, it's already there on my demo that on my social platform handle. So this is my Twitter handle and uh, this is my LinkedIn. So I'm active on all these platforms. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you have any feedback or suggestions for me also, I'll be happy to take it and I'll answer each and everything. Okay, thank you so much. I think we ran out of time now. Thank you everyone so much, especially our speaker, Karyan. So, mm -hmm. and also we have our moderator here also. Uh, Shomtana, thank you so much for helping us and everyone. Almost the end of our uh, conference now. I hope everyone will have fun. Okay, so yeah. thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pui. Thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thank you.